Hungry Trilobite podcast would like to start by acknowledging SoonerCon. Join us for Oklahoma's premier pop culture convention. SoonerCon returns June 20th through 22nd, 2025. This will be the 33rd year for SoonerCon, and this year will bring even more cosplay, celebrity guests, kids' workshops, gaming, comic art, and after-hours events. Visit SoonerCon.com for details. And welcome. Good afternoon, Fan Expo Chicago. How are you all doing out there? I would like to thank you all for coming to this live recording of the Hungry Trilobite podcast. If anybody is not super familiar with the show, what we do is we talk about fandom and how it makes our lives better. Uh, Everybody in this building has a story to tell about how they found something or other, and that story changed their life forever, and that's why they're here today. I'm here with my good friend Kaylee Rosen here, who has a booth here at the show. I hope you check it out. Um, Now, Kaylee, we talked a while back about your fandoms, and you have things at your booth from things like Pokemon and Studio Ghibli, but a lot of your stuff is your tarot cards. Yeah. Yeah. I do, I'm working on a full tarot set. Um, I am only like nine cards into the 72 set, but I, I think it's 72. My brain is a little off the rails right now. Um, but I just, I re- what I really love about tarot cards <laughs> is um, the way that every single artist who works on them has their own unique perspective on each and every card you see. Um, not only the artist, but the reader themselves. So it's an entirely personal experience to each and every time that every deck is read for each person. And I find that extremely wonderful. I think it's a fantastic insight to the way that each person thinks and feels about the way they perceive the world. Yeah. We, the last time we talked, the phrase you used was seeing into yourself. That, that we use the art as a way of looking into wh- how we see the world and trying to show that to others. And now you're saying to me, if I'm understanding correctly, and I might not be, that you know, not only does tarot show the person what they're looking for about themselves, but it's a reflection of the artist too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I collect tarot card decks. It, it's really important to me. And what I found is every time I read... Um, my a new deck I discover something about the person who created the deck themselves because every single deck has a brief description book of um, each and every card within it and I notice these slight differences between different cards and their meanings and I find that is the most important part and that's the most valuable part of each deck that you you receive and each one you purchase now I'm talking about this like I know anything about it and I don't so please let me walk through this here um, when you're saying that you're seeing differences in this, is, are you say, talking about differences in how the cards are interpreted? And Exactly. Um, so each card has like this base meeting, for lack of a better term. Um, and then the way that different people, whether you're reading it or creating it, um, extrapolate on that, like see the base meaning and interpret it through their own lens is the part that makes each and every deck unique. Now, I'm, I'm a writer, and I'm looking at this from that perspective, that you're essentially giving somebody story prompts about their own life. That's an interesting way to think about it. Um, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> oh, I've never thought about it that way. Um, I think a good way to think about it is it is very story-based. And I find that when you read um, a deck of cards or a read a, a spread, it is like telling a story. So it's not just you pull one card and that has one fixed meaning. It's about its relationship with the other cards that you pulled and the relationship with the person reading them and the relationship with the person who made them. Right? It's all about these interconnected lines that you see within each deck and each card itself. Okay. Now, looking at the things I'm a little more familiar with, uh, the Pokemon and the Studio Ghibli, there's not a natural flow from those two to the other. So how did this come into your life? That's a great question. Actually, my brother taught me how to read tarot. I remember, like, when I was in high school, he, he brought one of his own decks, and he showed me 
what it meant to like read tarot and it's not about like reading the future more as it's about learning about yourself from a different perspective and I, I that was the first time I realized that and I was fascinated by that idea and so I just from there I've been collecting them I've been making my own cards and it's just it's opened my eyes up to this whole different way of experiencing art mm -hmm. so when you now if you can't talk about this that's okay but you're creating your own deck what is the theme or what are the themes that you're looking to work into that that you might not have seen in another deck i i don't know if i've i've particularly chased a certain theme or motif or anything like that i'm just personally interested in exploring my own interpretation of each card right like that's my favorite part about each deck is experiencing other artists interpretation of the cards so that's what I want to express with my own deck. Do you have an idea of when it's going to be complete? No idea. <laughs> because I know with the, such a huge project, it's really hard to get that kind of... Yeah, I, what I've been doing recently is whenever I'm experiencing any like art block or I don't know what to draw next, I have a set of cards in the back of my head for what I want to draw, and I'll just go, okay, so I don't know what to draw next, so I guess I'll draw my next tarot card, you know? And so it has taken me a while, but I'm hoping that as I continue to work on it, I'll gain more and more momentum. And eventually, before I realize it, I'll have a full deck ready to sell. What I'd actually be interested in seeing more than anything else is if you were to line these cards up chronologically by how you did them, if your view of yourself changes from beginning to end. That's really interesting. I've certainly noticed that my art style has changed. Um, I don't know if other people can notice, because obviously I can't perceive my own artwork from outside my own experiences. Um, but at least I can notice the pieces I did earlier versus the pieces I did later, which I find quite interesting as an experience of self-reflection. Now, I'm guessing there's probably at least one person, if not several people in this audience, who might be looking to get a little more artistic after seeing some of the art that we have at the show here. What might you say to them to, to try to push them a little bit further in that direction? Um, everyone sucks at first. I mean, that's how art is. There's, the talent is love. That's all that it is, is just wanting to keep drawing even after you make something that sucks because everyone makes bad art. Um, it's just the experience of making art is making something that you hate and then making something that you love right after it. And I think that's the most important thing to remember is that the most recent thing you made is not the only thing you'll ever make. You'll find that with a lot of the people over in the celebrity thing back there where they're known for something they did 30 years ago and people have no idea what they did last week. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and here we're talking about the top tier of people who got known for something. Yeah. And that ends up being what they deal with. Yeah. I, you know, my friend is a big fan of Asterian and I know he's here, and I just, I see the lines for him, and I, I can't even imagine the experience of being that actor and having to sign all of these cards for this man. I, I think it's amazing. <laughs> and I hope, and I, it's not my place to say how they should feel, but I hope they get some satisfaction in just knowing that that one thing they did way back when did make a lot of people happy and actually did make some good in the world. I think that's why I like conventions so much, or I love conventions so much, is because you see such a wide breadth of love for such a wide variety of things. Like the vast majority who, of people who walk past me during these shows, I have absolutely no idea what they're passionate about, but I can tell that they have some deep, deep love in their heart for something. And I think that that's why I love these places, because it's this just community of passion, you know? And that's... I don't know if you're, how long you've been tracking cons, but something that's kind of come up in the last few years is people complain that cons aren't just about comic books anymore or they're not just about Star Trek anymore. And I can't see that as a complaint. For me, that's a win. I, you know, my dad is the reason why I'm so into fandoms and everything associated with them. And he's definitely more into those, like, comic books, that... 
Batman, like Superman, all of that stuff. And although we can like bond over our love of fandoms, we certainly don't share the same ones, but that doesn't make our love of them any less or our ability to talk about how much we love them any less. And I think it's a good thing that we're seeing more and more people of various different love of shows and comics and everything show up. It's not like people are leaving or less Star Trek people are showing up. We're just seeing more people from different uh, fandoms show up. Yeah, I, I remember when Power Rangers first started eking into the Comic-Con scene and within about two years, it was everywhere. And you're seeing that now with so many other things. that, that They start out with just one or two people showing up, and then suddenly there's a crowd. Oh, yeah. I um, can certainly see that. I, I have some shows that I've made fan art of that I love, and I know that n they're not as popular as some of the other shows out there, but I'm not going to stop making fan art for them because I see the people who don't see fan art for these shows like get drawn to my booth because they're so excited to see that someone loves these shows as much as they do. And that's actually pretty smart business too. <laughs> well. <laughs> no, no, seriously, because you're going to find somebody who's like, I never saw anybody draw this poster of Gamera before, and now I have to have it. Yeah, yeah. You, you exactly. might only sell two, but you're going to find the right two people. Yeah, that's what makes me so happy is, um, you know, I see someone come up to my booth, they say, oh, I've never seen someone do like fan art of this show before and I'm like yay that means I get to like build a community around my art based on how much we all love this more niche anime or whatever you know so what do you have any examples of something that you're working on that you, you've just felt you had to do it even though it might not have a crowd um I don't tend to well that's a good question um I do a lot of fan art for like more niche characters within like popular shows like I don't know if anyone's read the Chainsaw Man manga, but I did a, a fan art of Halloween from Chainsaw, the Chainsaw Man manga. And I don't get a ton of people recognizing her yet, but when they do, it's just, it's such a fun experience being able to talk about this character that shows up for very little time within a very popular manga. Mm -hmm. like, uh, just to, to give a kind of an example, uh, once somebody brought a guy up to my booth and the dude was wearing a t-shirt with a flux capacitor on it and a kilt. And he said, what is this guy? And without even thinking about it, within two seconds, I said, great, Scott. Exactly. And th that, that's that moment where it's like you just make a friend. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's another thing I love so much about these shows is that a I've made so many friends at these places. And I, you know, we don't share a lot of the same like love of the same shows some of them we do share but not all of them but that doesn't but that makes me love these shows that I've never experienced so much more like I've never played Baldur's Gate but now I have a special place in my heart for Asterion because I have a friend who loves him a lot you know and I feel like these events are almost like a, a petri dish for you growing your fandom into other you're trying something out you might have seen it on a t-shirt or just had a chat with somebody Exactly. Like, I've learned about so many new shows be and, like, pieces of media because I have talked to people and they've told me, oh, my gosh, you love this show. You have to watch this show. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And these events are, they're like the heart and soul of the indie comics industry now. Oh, my gosh. Indie comics. You just hit a soft spot in my heart. Really? Yes. Oh, I love indie comics. Any... If I go into a bookstore and they have like a comic section, I bypass Marvel, bypass DC, and I look for the artists who like are like reso printing their own zines. Like that's what means the most to me in the world. So, is there a certain one you found lately? Mm. Sorry. Sorry. Right. <laughs> I recently read. Um, a, I believe it's independent. You know, indie comics has a bit of a vague term, but I recently read Finding Duke. Um, I don't know who it's by, but it's phenomenal. It's about looking for this bug in this fictional universe, like as a researcher, and like discovering that community is more important than like purpose. And it meant a lot to me, and it's just beautiful. And it's very slow and very quiet, and that's why I love it so much. Is it's it's not exactly something that you would find like published by Marvel. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It was at the last Fan Expo event here 
that I was, uh, I came into possession of a comic called Hunter Ninja Bear. <laughs> Are you familiar? I'm not, but that sounds amazing. It, it is, because <laughs> it does what it said on the tin. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, essentially, uh, without giving away too much of the plot, they, there is this three-way war between a group of hunters, a group of ninjas, and a group of bears. Exactly. That is what it is. And, and it, you get this, if this was, if this was a movie... This would be the best B movie ever made. Oh my gosh, yes. I me and my partner love watching those like really 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 low grade animes that cost like $5 to make and have like a frame rate of two like two frames a second, like awful. And just like watching them and just having our hearts filled with love just for like how just silly and goofy and off the rails they can get. And that was something we talked about last time. By the way, you were episode 183. If anybody wants to check our previous chat here, we got the talking about bad movies mm. and the fact that we enjoy them quite a bit, even yeah. though they're not technically great, they're great art. Exactly, exactly. I am very passionate about this idea of like art that doesn't sell well, but you can feel how much the artist loves what they made. That, like, that's what means the most to me, is when you can feel the artist's hand in their own work, it, it's so much more authentic. And even if it's not as technically perfect or polished, it, it's so much more real and feels so much more like you're collecting a piece of that person. You know what I mean? And, like, for example, using Hunter Ninja Bear as an example, you hear it and you say, wait, this is the concept, I have to see this. Yes. And you're almost positive that whoever came up with the concept loved it just as much as you did. Exactly. They're not trying to do something that's going to change the world. They're doing something that means something to them. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love so much about that kind of stuff is like Hunter Din Ninja Bear. It's like, this person had this idea and they wanted to make art of it and they did not care if it was going to be something groundbreaking. Like, you know, somebody comes up with a movie and it's about a, a, a vampire with a laser gun trying to fight pirates. And you're like, okay, how's this going to go down? Exactly, exactly. I, it's just so much fun when you just see the, arti the artist or the writers or anything just go, okay, now how can we make this even crazier? How mm -hmm. can we make this even more fun? How can we laugh as hard as we can in the writer's room? That's what makes me feel so much joy when consuming a piece of media. And, you know, we watched cartoons and movies as kids that kind of had that approach. Exactly. And we took it as natural. Exactly. I mean, like, I have such a love and appreciation for children's media because of the fact that there, there's not really usually any rails on it, and there doesn't have to be, right? Like, with for an example that's coming to my mind from my personal childhood is like the amazing world of gumball is just so linear in this very like let's just fit as much as we can into this and have a blast while we do it mm -hmm. and i think i think that's just such a fun experience and it's such a fun way to explore art absolutely um just to, to grab whatever for some reason gumby's coming to my mind right now and i'm not even a big gumby fan <laughs> But you have to say, whoever came up with that, there was no mold for this, no pun intended. Oh, somebody absolutely. just said, can this work? Let's run with it. I, claymation is such a silly medium for anything. And especially, like, when you can just, you literally see the artist's hand in that form of art. Mm -hmm. Like, you can see their fingerprints if you pause it at the right moment. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. I think it's such a blast. I think, you know, like... We're referencing two different eras of cartoons, but we can still have the same love of them because there's just no rails ever. There's no one ever like trying to market it too hard. Yeah, and you're kind of looking, especially with children's media, for the financial reasons where they need to make money off it, if it doesn't grab that audience, it goes away. Yeah, absolutely. So there's an incentive, or at least there used to be, to try anything that worked. Oh well, yeah. Might work. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think you know we've we've seen a little bit of the the he the heavy marketability like getting in the way of a lot of pieces of art recently. But I think that doesn't hasn't stopped like with YouTube. It it makes it a lot more easy for these pieces of art to gain audiences without having to be marketable. 
Yeah, YouTube has given anybody a platform if they want it to be there. Exactly, exactly. I've seen some things get go find an audience that like would never have been able to find an audience if um, a producer was behind it. Mm -hmm. I, I, a while back, we had a discussion about how we really need to treasure the human element in these things. And, you know, whether it's a somebody, a something like a cartoon that's had a, a team of 50 people or just one person with, what's the thing that replaced Flash? I can't remember anymore. Oh, I don't know either. Okay, well, sorry. <laughs> your animation program of choice—it doesn't really matter what it is. Yeah. Yes, I I definitely see that. Like I I think that digital art specifically has started has gotten a bad rap in the last couple of years because a lot of people will claim that it like takes the artist's hand out of the piece, and I think that there is something that digital art can't replace that you find in t traditional media, but um, I don't think that you're losing the artist's hand just because you're drawing on a screen. I would agree with that. I, I think that, that just saying that digital art takes the artist's hands out of it is just kind of downplaying what the artist is doing in the first place. They're, they're looking at the tool and saying, how do I apply this? Exactly, exactly. What, that tool might be a brush, it might be a pencil, it might be a mouse. It, that's not really the defining factor. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think... I've seen some absolutely wild drawings done in MS Paint where you can really do feel the artist's hand within the piece, whether or not it was created with a brush on paper. Yeah, and Microsoft Paint being an extremely clunky tool, but oh, we've all used it for something or other. Oh yeah, we've all drawn something terrible in Microsoft Paint, but somehow people have manipulated like this very rudimentary pro drawing program into a really phenomenal art program that can create some gorgeous pieces of illustration. Do you have a story about something you might have worked on at that point in time? Oh, I've never used Microsoft Paint. <laughs> no. Well, actually, I have probably okay. when I before I can like got into art, but um, I don't know if anyone here will recognize it. But my first digital art program was actually Paint Tool Sci, okay. which was is very old compared to the programs used nowadays. Um, it was like used to draw, anyone who's used it like remembers drawing their worst anime fan art ever on it. It's, it's quite a unique experience using a program quite so, well, now old fashioned. <laughs> fair, fair. I, I brought it because I would have a history of trying to copy video game sprites into Microsoft Paint and the way the colors would map would not always work, so you then had to make adjustments for that. And it would have been far better for me to have just learned how to do it right in the first place. But that wasn't an option when I was 13. Oh, exactly. You know, I, I have such a special place in my heart for those awful, awful pieces of art you made on the worst drawing programs ever. Um, like trying to learn how an RGB slider works with having never used anything other than like the watercolors in your middle school art room. Like, I think that's such a blast, and it's so fun to see how bad and how much love is in those pieces. Because you, you can tell that person had something in mind. They were trying to get it. They didn't understand the tools, but they were determined. Oh, absolutely. Like, especially with a program like Microsoft Paint, where there's no layers, and you have to, like, hand-select each Im color, you can tell just how much fun this person had to have had while they did it, because it had to be a labor of love. Mm -hmm. And just to, to think of somebody who, again, might be in this audience here thinking of going into digital art, if you really feel like doing that, if you really want to make it happen, there's no shame in doing it the wrong way. Oh, absolutely. I mean, like, I think that's what's so fun about digital art itself is that there's so many tools to make it easier. Mm -hmm. But if you want to do it the hard way, there's no one stopping you. I mean, there's never been any rules for art. And digital art just makes it easier to do it wrong in the best way possible and discover new ways that no one else has noticed, like, and roundabout, like, paths to a new destination. Are you a fan of the Angry Video Game Nerd by any chance? Which video game? Angry Video Game Nerd. 
I am not. I've okay. never heard of them. It's a YouTube channel. It's been running for like 20 years at this point. Wow. It, they've had like 300 episodes. But the, the point I'm getting at is that the J man who runs it, James Rolfe, if you actually look at his behind the scenes stuff, he does stuff in the worst manner possible. <laughs> I mean, he has like, the, he's gone to build rigs and, and props when he could have just bought them for half the price and half the time, but he did it because it's what makes sense to him. Exactly, exactly. I see a lot of people go, well, I could have bought this and it, could have been, it would have been better if I had bought it and it would have been cheaper if I had, but I love this piece so much more because I made it by hand. Mm -hmm. And you know, like that means so much more to me than having a manufacturer produce something for you just because you wanted the actual end product. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, Kaylee, I want to keep talking to you because I'm having a good time here. But I at least want to give the audience a chance to ask any questions, maybe pitch in their own ideas if they might have any thoughts or opinions. And if not, that's okay too. <laughs> I just thought I'd give them the option out there. Yeah, totally. Okay. Okay. So. Okay. You, you're a Studio Ghibli fan. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you had more, saw something last time that really, really moved you. Yes. Okay. I'm thinking back about all the Ghibli movie or Ghibli movies I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Okay. I believe I, I believe you're talking about the boy and the heron. Yes. Okay. Yes. I knew there was a bird involved. Yes. <laughs> it's phenomenal. It is truly, truly. It's my personal now favorite Ghibli movie. And that's saying something, considering all of the amazing movies that are out there. Is that something that you would use as uh, a way to bring somebody into? It's high level stuff. Not, no. If you're interested in looking at Studio Ghibli, a good place to start would be like My Neighbor Totoro, but The Boy and the Heron is, so it's probably going to be Hayao Miyazaki, who's the director of almost every Ghibli movie, his last movie, and it is an ode to every movie he's ever made. So it's going to be a wild ride if you haven't seen any other Ghibli movie, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, no, My Neighbor Totoro or Spirited Away, if you want to get into Studio Ghibli, that's the place to start. Mm -hmm. But there's something, there's a value in something like that that's a higher level, a self-referential book, I think, we, or a self work, I should say, that you get to a point where you need to give something to the fans who have already gone through the, the 105 level stuff. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that's why I love it so much, is it, it's very, it is truly a love letter to the process of creating art and the experience of making it your entire life. And I, I love, love the way that they explored it um, through like showing the way that art can be used and created throughout your entire life and even after you pass on. I think it's phenomenal. Um, and I appreciate that he didn't make it to introduce new fans into the, sh into the, the studio but to like create a thank you and a goodbye to the people who have been there with him the entire time. And I'm sure a fair number of those people that were you know, getting those messages themselves became artists because of it. Oh, absolutely, of yeah. I can't tell you the amount, the amount of artists I know that got into creating art because of the work that Hayao Miyazaki has done. Mm -hmm. um, when you actually have that, and you'll find some other franchises around here, you got things like Ninja Turtles, that, that you'll start out with the people working on it now were people that had the chance to grow up with it. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think that's so much fun. Like, I have seen the way that like the show SpongeBob has evolved over the years. Like, I think it just hit its like 25th anniversary. Like, the people who started that show are not, probably not working on it anymore, but they definitely were fans of it when they watched it as a kid. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really, really interesting to see the way that it changes the show itself, the piece of art itself. And that's interesting, because we started off this conversation saying that it's great to approach something not knowing what it's supposed to be until you put your hands in it, and yet there's also something really special about you know, having a vision for what this is supposed to be institutionally and being able to put your own spin on it afterward. I, yeah, yeah, I think there's different types of art for both, like, both 
experiences. I think some art, you do, like, it is much more, much, you're able to appreciate it much better when you have the context behind the experience of creating it. And some of it, it's just, it's so much fun to just go in it with no context, no experience, and just allow yourself to be taken away to another world by the piece of art. It, it kind of reminds me, I, I, was, I was thinking of a couple of works, but there was a, a series called Just Imagine about 20 years ago. Uh, and somebody had the, the idea, they were going to make a four-issue comic run. Uh, they were going to let Stan Lee take his spin at doing DC Heroes his way. Oh, yeah. He made a Batman, he made a Superman, he made a Green Lantern, and I think a Wonder Woman, if I remember correctly. And, but they, the only rule was that he couldn't actually build it off of anything that existed. He had to do it his way. Interesting. It was interesting. And that just becomes a, a case of you understand that the, the right artist has to find the right project at the right time. Oh, absolutely. It's all about timing and, like, passion and... Everything just has to come together exactly in the right way at the right time to find mm -hmm. that kind of spark. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't even necessarily say, e even though I enjoyed the comics for what they were, they weren't that good. It, to, to, not that anything against Stan Lee or anything against the characters, but it wasn't the right mix. Oh, exactly. Like, if he didn't have the love for the characters and it wasn't like, it didn't feel authentic to him, then it's not going to be good, even if you're the best artist in the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that's really valuable to understand is that maybe it's just like the wrong context for your art, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I remember I was a big X-Files fan back in the day, kind of got away from it toward the end. But there was one season where the big story was that Stephen King was going to write an episode. Oh, interesting. And that, you got pumped for that. Yeah. And I remember watching it thinking, that sucked. <laughs> well, I mean, as someone who loved Stephen King, I was Likewise. addicted to his stuff when I was um, in high school and in college. He has some really, really low points. He has some really high points in his literature, but not all of it is as good as the best pieces he's made. <laughs> and that's going to happen with anybody. I mean, especially with the amount of books he's created, I mean, it would be impossible to have every single one be perfect. True. Very true. Yeah, like, I mean, I think that goes back to what we were saying earlier, is, like, even the best artists in the world are going to make bad art sometimes. That's just the way that art exists. It may also be a case of that he just historically hasn't worked well on anything that winds up on screen. You know what? That could also be it. Like, it's about context, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you could be the best writer or author in the world, and suck at screenwriting. It, it's all part of context and the way that your own personal perspective is um, expressed and the medium through which it's expressed. Okay. Now I'm just going to ask your perspective as a fan, no right or wrong answer here, do you think he works better doing horror or fantasy? I personally, I am a horror fan. I love horror um, in most contexts. So, I mean, that's why I love horror is his horror work. So I'm going to have to go with that. Okay. I really, really enjoy his fantasy. I have read some of his fantasy a long time ago. Um, and I did think his, like, world building was really interesting. Um, but, I, I mean, nothing's going to top a good, a good jump scare in literary form. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm also a big Junji Ito fan. I don't know if you know who he is. I don't. I'm sorry. It's okay. He's a very, very prolific, very famous um, horror mangaka. And he's written some... You've probably seen his art if you've never heard Prob his name. Yeah. Um, and his stuff is always about the, the shock factor and the, oh my gosh, that's so creepy <laughs> kind of aesthetic. <laughs> I am not a horror fan, but I am a fan of horror fans. And what I mean by that is that, without a doubt, horror fans are always the most chill group of people out there. <laughs> like, I get that. <laughs> I, I was just as an example, I am a Star Wars fan, big time. But I know my people, and my people have some rough edges. <laughs> I, like, you'll talk, what did you think of the latest movie? Like, Oh my God, that movie was horrible. It was an insult to everything I stand for. It ran over my dog. Yeah. And they just, they can't stop talking about how bad it was. Yeah. 
But you go to a horror fan and you say, did you see, you know, Slasher Movie 7? They're like, it was so bad I have to show it to you. We exactly. have to have a party. I, I have to sh Even though they don't like it, they're excited about getting the chance to watch you hate it too. Oh, absolutely. I think that's why so many people love horror is just because it's very, it's never been, especially film horror, has never has been a high concept form of media. There are some really phenomenal and really like artistic horror films out there, but um, there are some pieces of horror that like the reason it exists is because of the camp, mm -hmm. because it's the like terrible slasher, like face mask kind of fiction. And so I think that context is what made the f fan base exist. And so I think that might be why like, people are like, oh, it sucks. That's why I love it. Yeah, and, and just <laughs> so many fandoms don't get that concept that you just find the value in it, you find the joy in it, even if that joy is just watching somebody else take the roller coaster. Oh, exactly, exactly. I, I love that perspective. It's, it, it's very much so a roller coaster yeah. of a genre, and you're not expecting to have some world-changing storyline behind it you just want to watch like some wacky stuff happen and on screen with no breaks and no stops and that's what's so fun about it yeah I, I think my big hang-up is that as a fan of things like star trek of dc comics where i get this giant world that keeps folding into itself and at least the the illusion of an overarching plot and continuity movies that don't go for that tend to confuse me I, I do have to admit, I'm not all that into horror movies. I do have an appreciation for them. But I, as a person, am very sensitive to jump scares. I don't like them, but I love reading horror because I think that it can really get under your skin in a really fun way. Um, but I do love camp, so I'll do anything for a good camp movie. Um, but yeah, like I, I mean, there are, there's art out there that I love because I love the story. And then there's art out there that I love because I love the way that the writers loved making it. I'm going to ask you one more question, then we're going to start wrapping up here. Sure. Because we started off this conversation talking about your art, and we had talked in the past that your art is something that you basically feel before you draw. And as somebody who likes literary horror, where you're imagining everything in your head, you don't get the visuals, do you see that thought process translate as you're making your own art when you're trying to feel something from the page in your head that you're putting onto the page later? Um, yeah, I think that goes back to our previous conversation about like the way I make tarot cards is I understand the concept and the feeling behind each piece and then I allow myself to experience my own interpretation of it um, in order to create the artwork. Like there's not a lot of direct conceptualization behind it. It's an understanding of the feeling I want to convey when expressing this piece. And that, I think, goes back to why I love tarot cards so much. Fantastic. Well, again, I want to remind everybody, your booth is in the Artist Alley, number 105. Where can people track your information on the web and possibly see the rest of your work? So I'm mostly on Instagram nowadays at Kaylee Rosen, K-A-I-L-E-E-R-O-S-E-N. You'll be able to find my Instagram there and follow me and uh, keep up to date with all of the shows I go to and all the art I'm making there. Okay, and I'm gonna have that and everything else we've talked about in the show notes on my website, aaronbosig.com. I encourage you to subscribe to the podcast because we have conversations like this on there all the time. My booth is right over there and there's a big stack of cards. You can pick up one of those cards and subscribe there or if you prefer a digital version, I can tap and subscribe right on your phone like that. I wanna thank you all for being here and. Please enjoy the rest of Fan Expo.